Marketing a product without clear positioning and messaging is like building a house on soft sand. During the hurricane season, it'll all come tumbling down. And the book on product positioning is April Dunford's Obviously Awesome. If you're a marketer and you haven't read it yet, stop right now and go buy it. April is a sought after speaker and recognized expert in positioning, having launched and consulted with hundreds of successful startups. I'm excited to dig into April's four part product story framework to help you win more business. When I wrote the first book, I wanted to focus just in on positioning. And I was a bit like, I think we know how to do a sales pitch. Like, I don't think I need to teach you how to do a sales pitch. But like, I'll tell you, from working with a couple hundred clients no. now, like, no, the answer is no. Like most companies are just, they're either doing a product walkthrough or they've got some kind of a pitch, you know, they just kind of made it up and they're iterating on it. And a lot of times in marketing, that's not really our job. You know, we're talking about the value we can deliver that no one else can. But in sales, that is absolutely our job. Our job is to answer the question, why pick us over the other guy? So we need a story that tells that. In this Marketing Power Ups episode, you learn first, why the hero's journey story framework isn't effective at closing deals. Second, Abel's four-part product story framework. Number three, how Help Scout pitches its product using Apple's framework. And number four, Apple's one piece of advice to help marketers accelerate their careers. For each episode, I create a power ups cheat sheet you can use, download, fill in, and apply the marketing concepts to your business right away. You can go to marketingpowerups.com to get those right now. Ready? Let's go. Marketing Power Ups. Here's your host, Rambly John. It's obvious selling is hard. If it is, then everybody would be salespeople. But you also said buying is hard in a presentation while doing this research. I, I saw you say that. Can you share why uh, that is? Uh, I believe you have a story uh, around why buying buying is hard. And it's that's obvious that people think. So, so here's the thing. Like, I think we accept this idea that selling is very hard and you know, particularly when we're working in startups, like sales is hard and how are we going to, you know, how are we going to get people, convince them to buy our stuff because otherwise we don't get to stay in business. And I like to kind of turn that around a little bit and look at it from the customer's perspective. And, and I think that actually buying is hard. It's way harder than we think. Interesting. And, you know, and when I say that, usually people are like, what do you mean, April? Buying, buying stuff is not hard. Like it's like shopping. I wish that was my job. I could just go shopping. But when when we say that, you know, usually we're thinking about things that don't have a lot of stakes, right? Like buying shoes. I, I like buying shoes. Buying shoes are fine. I like buying a drink at the bar. I like buying a nice meal at a restaurant. Now, these things are fun to buy. Like, and it's no big deal if I pick wrong. No biggie. I just don't buy that kind again. Um, but if we think about um there are lots of things that we buy that are terrible and really difficult. Like like buying insurance is super that's, difficult. And, that's true. and part of the reason it's difficult is because there's a lot of choices and I don't want to get them wrong because if I get them wrong, then bad things will happen. If we think about B2B, most of the things that businesses buy are terribly difficult to buy. So like, let's say I, I, I'm trying to buy accounting software. Like that's actually a really hard thing to buy. The stakes are high. Like if I pick the wrong thing, bad things might happen. And the person responsible for buying something inside an organization, there's a few things to think about. One is most of the time in B2B, the champion that we are selling to inside the account has never purchased a product like ours before. Think about that. Never purchase, like the person that's trying to figure out what accounting package to buy, they've never bought an accounting package before. So what do they know? Like they don't know anything about the vendors. They don't know what the state of the art of accounting software is. They don't know what features are important or what aren't important. They don't know how to make a short list. They don't know how to, like they don't know. And they got to make a recommendation to their boss. Like, hey, I looked at all my options and this is what we're going to buy. Like if they get that wrong, bad things, right? Everybody in the accounting department hates this software and then they hate <laughs> you, right? They're like, you're going to look like a dummy to your boss because you picked the wrong thing. And like, maybe you fail the audit, 
And, and then you get fired because you were the idiot that brought that terrible <laughs> software and they did that thing. It's true. So it, 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 these are fraught decisions made by people that have never bought a thing like this before, so they don't know anything about it. And so if you look at the research on this, the research shows that 40 to 60% of B2B purchase processes end in no decision. Wow. And so why does that happen? Because that person tasked with, hey, buy us some new accounting software, that person doesn't know how to make a short list, doesn't know, how, is really freaking out, doesn't know how to confidently pick the right one. And if they don't figure it out and figure it out in a way where they can really confidently go to their boss and say, I looked at all my options. It's obviously this one. We have to pick this one. If they can't do that, the easiest thing, the easiest, lowest risk thing for them to do is to go to their boss and say, you know what? Now's not a good time. But let's not buy anything. Like, why don't we just kick the can down the road? We'll make a decision next year because, you, you know, we're, you know, we're in the middle of doing stuff right now. Let's do it next year. 40 to 60% of the time, that's exactly what happens. Like the customer is not saying, oh, I choose to stay with the status quo thing because I love that way better. No, they can't confidently make a decision that they're sure isn't going to come back on them in some bad way. And so they just say, you know what? We're just going to stick with what we have. We, it kind of sucks. We don't love it but we're going to stick there because any decision I make here feels risky. So we don't actually consider that in, in our marketing and sales enough, in my opinion, because what we're typically doing to customers in that situation that are trying to figure out how do I make choices is we're just in there pitching our stuff. Hey, we got this accounting software. It's great. Let me show you all the features. Does that help that person figure out what's the right choice to make? It doesn't. The research on this is actually really interesting too. Like the research on this shows like, what does a customer actually want from us in a sales situation? What they want is, first of all, they want to understand their choices. So what are the other alternatives out there and how should they be thinking about it? And the second thing is they want insight into the market, which is kind of the same thing. So what they're expecting from us is to talk about the whole market and how we fit in the market. And instead we're like, nah, you figure that out. You figure that out on your own. I'm just talking about my stuff over here. So if you want, I can give you a stupid example. You want me to give you a stupid example? No, I love I love that example. I know you're I talking about that. Uh, it, it, yeah. Because it's personal and it's... Uh, it's yeah, it's so I got thinking about this, you know, how hard it is to buy stuff. Like sometimes I'll get pushback from founders on this and they'll say, well, you know, our stuff is actually not that hard to buy. You know, it's not that hard to buy. Right. It's not that complicated, whatever. And I'm like, no, you don't understand. Like uh, things like this are really hard to buy. And so I had this experience where um, I... I bought a new house, it, not a new house, but an old shitty house. <laughs> an old shitty house has an old shitty bathroom. And, uh, and I hire a guy to come renovate the bathroom. And the guy says, guy says, uh, yeah, um, you're going to need to pick a new toilet. You got to go buy a <laughs> toilet and then I'm going to install it, whatever. And I said, oh, okay. Toilet. Never bought a toilet before, but you know, how hard could it be? I'm going to go buy a toilet, go to the toilet store, walk in the toilet store and, uh, toilet, salesman walks up to me and says, Hey, can I help you? And I said, yeah, looking for a toilet. And he says, what kind of toilet do you want? And I'm like, one that flushes? <laughs> what do you mean? Like, one that what? works. <laughs> what do you mean? He goes, Oh, we got all kinds of toilets. Toilets are all back there. You know, go back to the thing and look at the toilets. And I'm like, okay. So I go back there and there's, there's like hundreds of toilets, oh, hundreds man. of toilets. <laughs> like, there's so many toilets. And the worst part is they all look the same but they are not the same. Like it's <laughs> all got these little, you know, sheets beside everyone. And says, so here's the price. Some of them are a hundred bucks. Some are a thousand bucks, and, but they look the same. And then there's this list of features underneath and it's gobbledygook. Like, I don't know what any of these things mean. And so they're talking about gravity assisted BF4, you know, whether or not there's cut a flapper. I'm like, I don't know what a flapper is. I don't know what any of this stuff is. <laughs> So I'm in there looking at all this stuff. I spend like an hour in the store looking at this thing, and I and I come to this inclusion. I'm like, oh shit, I don't even, I don't know enough to be able to buy a toilet. Mm. Like crap. So I go home, I get on the internet, and 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 there's all this stuff. Like there's like I go to Consumer Reports, and they've got the thing about toilets. Oh my god, there's 59 things you got to think about with toilets. There's like 
single flush, dual flush, seed height, all this, how it flushes, flappers, trapways, all this stuff. I'm like, oh my God, there's all this stuff. And like, I don't want to know anything about toilets. Like, I just want to buy a toilet that does not break. Like, I don't want to buy a bad toilet because I don't want to be calling a plumber every week. I just want a toilet that works. And so I get this idea, like, so I'm freaking out. I spend like three weeks going back and forth to the show where I'm looking at toilets and I'm like, ah, I can't make a decision. And so finally I get this bright idea. Like, I'm not going to buy any toilet. I'm not going to buy no toilet. I'm going to keep the old toilet. <laughs> old toilet was working just fine. Right. Was just fine. So then I'm like, that's it, right? So I spent three weeks. I went to the showroom two, three times. I spent like infinity on the internet. How many toilets did I buy? Zero. Zero. That's just like what's happening with your buyers, right? They're paralyzed. They're looking at all this stuff. They can't figure out. They can't make a choice. And we're basically going to them and going, blah, 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 Here's all the features. And they're like, I don't know. Any of these features matter? I don't know. How do I pick between this one and that one? I don't know. And so we're doing exactly that. And so what happened for me, so this is funny. I go to my contractor and I'm like, hey, I, you know, I've decided I'm not going to buy a toilet. Like, I'm a busy person. I got stuff going on. I got kids. I got a dog. You know, I'm too busy. And and the guy says, look, lady, like we took the toilet out of here. We recycled it. It's gone. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Can't keep the old toilet. Not an option. And I'm like, right. oh, my contractor, he's burned the boats, right? Like, oh, my gosh, shit. Now I got to go back and buy the toilet. So, so I go back into the toilet store. I go to a different toilet store. Guy comes up and says, can I help you? And I said, yes, I cannot leave here without a toilet. Like, oh, my God, I got to buy a toilet today. This is terrible. And the guy's like, oh, yeah, buy a toilet. It's really hard. And I'm like, yes, it is. Why are there so many choices? Why are there all these features? I don't even want to. Like, I just want to, I just want to buy a toilet work. And the guy says, look, I'm going to teach you how to buy toilets. He says, it's easy. You only need to think about three things. Quality, aesthetics, price. That's all we got to think about. And I'm like, okay, teach me toilet Obi-Wan. <laughs> and the guy says, Yeah. First thing, quality. See all these ones over here? They're like 200 bucks. All these ones over here, like a thousand bucks. It's a quality thing. All those mm. features you're talking about, like flappers and trapways and all that stuff. Higher quality toilet lasts a lot more flushes before you, you got to do maintenance on it. Low quality toilet doesn't last that many flushes. And I'm like, well, who the hell buys a low quality toilet? And he's like, well, actually, like not all toilets get used a lot. Like some people have more than one toilet in their house and they got one in the basement. It gets flushed like once a month or something. He said, you'd be dumb to buy the really expensive one because this one's barely ever going to get flushed. Like you should buy one of these, put it in there. Like, you know, maybe it's for your cottage or something. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. And I said, well, look, this is actually my primary toilet. So I don't want one of those little colleagues. I want one of these. So, okay, fine. Forget about all those. Okay, good. We just narrowed the choices down by half. He goes, okay, second thing's aesthetics. Some people got a real look they're going for in their bathroom. Like they want their toilet to be super modern or they want it to be gold or whatever. And you'll pay way more for that, for that. So if, but if you got an aesthetic thing you're going for, then just look at these are the fashion toilets. And I'm like, look, I got no fashion, fashion requirements. <laughs> Forget about that. So he said, okay, well, don't look at any of those ones in the corner. Forget about those. And I'm like, this is good. We're getting down there. And then he says, okay, last thing is space. A lot of people got a really tiny spot for a bathroom. And so they got some kind of toilets where the tank goes in the wall. And that saves you like six inches or something. And so you can put the toilet in a way smaller spot. Problem is, if something breaks with the tank, you got to bust through the drywall to get in there and fix it. So that's the downside. So if you got a little wee space or you want to save some space, you go with the one on the wall. If you don't, you just give a regular one. I'm like, look, I got lots of space. I don't want to be busting out the wall if this thing breaks. So forget about those. This is fantastic. Now I'm down to three toilets. Now look, holy crap, this is great. I only got Amazing. three toilets. Which one would you pick? And the guy says, look, lady, I got to come clean with you. I actually work for Toto. Mm. So I'm going to tell you to buy the Toto toilet. But the other two toilets are fine too. They're all the same. Toto one costs you a little bit more. But I'll tell you, the reason I work for the company, I really believe in what they do. They get you know really high quality ratings. All the reviews are really high. You can go home and research it on the internet. I'm like, no freaking way. I'm not going back to the internet to research toilet stuff. And, and he says, if you just want to buy a toilet, never think about toilets again. That's the one you'd pick. I'm like, sign me up. Bought the toilet. Done. 10 minutes in and out. So think about that. It was that guy being a pushy salesperson? No, no, he didn't say, hey, here's the total one, here's why you should buy it. No, didn't do that at all. Uh, two, was he trying to like overwhelm me with a whole bunch of features like we do in software where we come in and we say, hey, I'm giving you the demo and I'm gonna show you every single feature and talk about, no, he didn't. What that guy was, he was acting like a guide and he's basically painting a picture of all the toilets in all the land and giving me a rubric 
to say, these ones are like this, these ones are like this, and these ones are like this. And depending on what you're looking for, here's how to narrow down the field. So what he's doing is giving me a way to look at the whole market and make a super confident choice myself. Now, I think we can do this in software, but we don't. And we don't for a whole bunch of reasons. One is we've been taught to never, ever talk about anybody but us, right? Don't talk about the competition. We don't want to be bashing the competition. Now, look, did my toilet guy bash the competition? No, he did not. In fact, he would have sold me a cheap, crummy toilet if I had told him, no, this is just a toilet that never gets used in the basement or whatever. Like the guy would have sold me that toilet. So, so, but we've been told that we can't talk about the, we got to pretend the competitors don't exist, we're just going to give you a pitch and it's, it's just about us. So that's the first thing. The second thing is we are under this impression that no one wants to hear our opinion, which is wrong, which is wrong. Because we've got this idea like, you know, we're biased. Nobody will believe us. And I'm telling you, I, if I'm talking to a sales rep, I do want to hear their opinion because you know what? I've never bought a thing like this before. I don't know anything about this. And you and we, as the vendors, know a lot. We're experts on this. We sleep and breathe this. We know the market better than anybody else. Why wouldn't we want to express our opinion about what's good and bad in the market? And leave it to the customer to decide whether or not to believe us, right? And if we can do this in a credible way, being as unbiased as we can, this is exactly what customers want from us. And so... So my thinking on this is we do a lot of thinking in marketing about talking about the value that our product can deliver that no one else can, but we do a really, really bad job when that prospect gets over to sales and sales has to deliver a pitch that says, look, here's, here's your choices and here's why and when you would pick us. I don't think we are arming the sales team with a story that lets them do what my toilet salesman did um, to give customers that have never bought a product like yours before a, a way of thinking about the whole market and a way to confidently say, yeah, this is the one that I want. Yeah, it's such a great, it's such a great story because it's so, so memorable and relatable, right? Like, uh, yeah. I haven't bought a toilet yet. Good, good thing I, I haven't had to smash yeah, my toilet bad. apart, but I can it's imagine. Bad, man. Like, there's it's a bad. lot of things. Like, if you go to do a renovation, you, all of a sudden you are thinking about things that you you didn't think there was going to be any space in your brain to think about, you know, toilets and sinks and taps and things. Like, it's the worst. What's crazy is most people probably think a toilet is a toilet. But you just, just share That's this right. whole story that it's not. It's I not a well, it's not. like <laughs> and of course it's not, right? Of course it's not. There's toilet vendors and there's toilet technology and they're all competing to like the same way that I'm Crazy. sure people sit and think like, oh, it's just email software, you know. <laughs> or, oh, it's just accounting software. No, it's not. There's a thousand vendors and a thousand things you gotta think about. One of the things you mentioned is around how marketers are not arming the, giving the sales team uh, a, a good enough story. Most marketers have probably heard of the hero's journey where this, there's this hero who is our customer and they have a problem and you, there's a guide, Obi-Wan Kenobi, or right. in this case, us, and right. they we give them a solution and then they live happily ever after. And you actually say uh, that you know this is good for some things, but it's actually not good for a sales pitch. Yeah. So, you know, I got some pretty strong opinions about this. Like, I, like here's, here's the first thing. As an organization, a software company has a lot of different stories that they tell. We don't just have one story. I, I say this and sometimes marketers will say, yes, we do. We just have this one story. We call it the, you know, the strategy narrative or something like this. This is absolute bullcrap. This is not true, right? We have the story of why do you want to be an employee here is very different from the story that we tell the investors. Why would you want to invest in this company? Which is also very different than the story we tell to prospects. Why do you want to exchange your cold hard cash for this thing that we sell? So first of all, we tell lots of different stories. And it would make sense that the storytelling structure that we use for these different types of stories is different because 
The audiences are different. The thing we're trying to compel the audience to do is different. And, you know, so the outcome of, you know, what's happening here is different. Now, if we look at, um, it's interesting, like in marketing, we're all, we're, we're, we learn the hero's journey and it, or variations on it. Like, it's funny. I got the book sitting here. Building a story <laughs> brand. And this is, this is the one everybody's read this building, book. Building this, a story this, brand. This is basically Donald Miller has done this amazing job of taking a hero's journey and turning it into this really, you know, streamlined, you know, six, seven step version, Love this it. thing called story brand. And this is how, how do we build a story? And it's, Uh, A character has a problem, meets a guide who gives them a plan and calls them to action, which allows them to be successful and avoid failure. Great. Makes sense. And I like this a lot, like just to be clear, like, and there's a lot of situations where I've used this, where I think it works very, very well. Like for example, in a customer case study, I I can, I can map that exactly. Right. So, you know, the character is the customer and they got this problem and then, you know, and then they used our stuff and then they achieve success and they avoided failure. It's amazing. It maps to this just fine. Here's a problem. I'm in a sales situation, right? So customer, like, and let, let's use me and my toilet thing as an example. I'm on my hero's journey. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Bert has a toilet. You got a problem. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I got a problem and I go and I get to the toilet store and I meet toilet Obi-Wan, who is my guy, and he's going to, you know, he's going to teach me Obi-Wan how to buy a toilet. Now, here's the thing. In this thing, it's, there's a step that says, who gives them a plan? What's the plan? This is what we need. How do we build the plan? And, and, uh, you know, much as I love Donna Miller, um, the, 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 this book's examples of the plans are absolute garbage, right? So, you know, the software example that he uses to plan, he says there's a three-step plan. Go to the website, sign up for the free trial, <laughs> buy, enjoy the software. It, it's wow. just a point. <laughs> no. <laughs> so in sales, my salesperson is the guide. So how do we build the plan? Man, this book ain't telling you how to do that. (laughs) So much as I love Hero's Journey, and I think it works well in marketing for certain things, like particularly customer case study or something like that, um, we can't use it in sales. Now, here's here's what normally is happening in sales. You know what normally happens in sales? There's no storytelling whatsoever. Here's what happens. There's a big button on your website. says, give me a demo. Customer clicks on that button. They get sent over to sales. And what do sales do? They give them a demo. Mm. Now, what's the structure of that demo? There is no structure, man. (laughs) There's no structure. Like, well, what I've seen is there's two, one of two things they do. One, they, they basically do a feature walkthrough. Here's how you log in. We got five menus. I'm going to click on every single menu and show you every single option, every single menu. That's it. Is that helping the customer make a decision? Does it, it's all on the customer. They got to figure out which of those features are differentiated or not differentiated from the other competitors. What's the value of any of those features? Why pick you and when? We're putting that all on the customer. You figure it out. I'm just going to show you the stuff. You figure it out, right? The closest I've seen to a structure on this with typical SaaS company is they'll do what I call the problem solution which is it's a little preamble before we get in and say, hey, you got a problem. You know, you got to do like accounting, but you got to do an audit and stuff with your accounting software. Hey, we're accounting software and we do that. And then we go and show them all the features. Feature, 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 feature. The problem with that is usually the definition of the problem is so vague. All your competitors solve that problem too. There's nothing differentiated about what you do. So... If, again, how do, we, how do we build a sales pitch? How do we build a sales pitch? Now, some companies I've seen attempt to do what they do with a VC. You know, so, you know, if I'm pitching an investor, and the investor pitch usually starts with, there's a change in the world. <laughs> <laughs> that, there's a change that. in the world, man. <laughs> the world is changing. And therefore... The status quo, whatever you're doing right now is shit. World's going to change. Something 
big is happening. And there's going to be death and destruction and fire. And, and after that, the only company standing will be the companies that use our stuff. Now, let me show you our stuff. That, so that's how they do it. Now, in a VC pitch, VC pitch is a particular kind of pitch. Like, first of all, you don't tend to talk too much about direct competitors in a VC pitch. You do it in a very macro way, right? And usually what you're talking about is everything else is the status quo, old shit, and you're the new hotness. And so all you have to do is position against the old stuff, status quo versus new hotness. And that is just too simple for the markets that we typically play in. Because typically we got status quo, which might be like a spreadsheet or a piece of paper or something or some old legacy system. But most B2B software, like companies are making a short list and you're competing against two or three other companies that also think of themselves as the new hotness. So how do you differentiate against them? You're all the new hotness. In a VC pitch, does it end? And starting with this change in the world, like typically it's just like a trend, you know, like, oh, right. you know, companies are, yeah. you know, companies are managing an increasing amount of data. Like your competitors are talking about that too. Sure. There's nothing differentiating. Like if you can spot the trend, they can spot the trend. Like, sure. so usually the problem with these pitches is they end up being sort of like a really simplistic version of problem solution, Right. No, there's a big trend. That's the problem. We're the solution to that. But we're going to ignore anybody else that looks like us. We, you know, the only competitor we'll admit is the old way of doing things. Again, we're we're not helping. We're not helping the customer make a map of the market, figure out who fits where, and then figure out what the, how they make the best decision. So I don't think the way we're doing this today is doing us any favors. Before we continue, I want to thank the sponsor for this episode, 42 Agency. When you're in scale-up mode, you have to hit your KPIs. The pressure is on to deliver demos and signups. It's a lot to handle. Demand gen, ABM, email sequences, revenue ops, and more. And that's where 42 Agency, founded by my good friend, Camille Rexton, can help you. They're a strategic partner that's helped B2B SaaS companies like ProfitWell, Teamwork, Sprout Social, and HubDoc build a predictable revenue engine. If you're looking for performance experts and creative to solve your hardest marketing problems at a fraction of the cost of income, look no further. Go to 42 Agency, that's number 42, agency.com, talk to a strategist, learn how you can build a high efficiency revenue engine now. Find that link in the description or show notes. Well, that's all for now. Let's jump back into this episode. Here, you've laid out this problem now and you, we've been working on this better way. Uh, can you share a better way to create a sales pitch that resonates with the audience? And I, I say sales pitch, I feel like it also could apply to messaging on website or you know a lot of different places. So yeah, I'd love to just hear what you're working on. So this has been, so this has been a, a problem close to my heart for a while because you know my whole jam is positioning. So in the work I do as a consultant, what I'm working with companies on is how to figure out what that company's differentiated value is and who's the best fit for that. So what we're trying to figure out is, you know, what's the value that only we can deliver versus all the competitors anywhere? What is the value that only we could deliver? And teamed with that, who really cares a lot about that value? So, you know, this is the thing we can do that no one else can. And here are the people that really love that because they need that because of, you know, what whatever. So my work has been oriented on that. So we, you know, so I work with a team, we get the team together, we work this through, we figure out, okay, this is the value only you can deliver. These are the people that really care about it. Marketing's happy because marketing can go do messaging because they'll take that differentiated value props and they'll use that to be on the website and everything else. The problem is, is when this, this, these leads hit sales and they get to sales and they're sitting across from sales and then sales just says, Okay, let me give you the feature walkthrough. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no. Right? And so what the customer actually wants is, why pick you over the other guys? They want the answer to that. And a lot of times in marketing, that's not really our job. You know, we're talking about the value we can deliver that no one else can. But in sales, that is absolutely our job. Our job is to answer the question, why pick us over the other guys? So we need a story that tells that 
in my opinion, there's a handful of things we got to think about. So just like in marketing, where the key to our story is our differentiated value, sales is the same thing. So what we want to be able to highlight, what we want in the middle of the story is this differentiated value, what we can do for your business that no one else can. And so a good sales story actually starts with, like, why is that value important? Right. And it's kind of like the answer to the question, like, why did we build it this way? Like, why do we build the thing that we built? Like, we built it different than everybody else. Like, why is it different? Like, who cares? So a lot of my thinking on this really changed when um, I, I got a job ages ago at IBM. And when I landed at IBM, they had a very particular way of building sales pitches there. And I'll tell you, there's a lot of stuff in that sales pitch structure that I would not want to copy. But one of the things I really liked about what they did was they always started a sales pitch with what they called market insight, which was, right. here's what we see in the market for customers like you, which I thought was kind of an interesting way it's almost like reverse engineering your differentiated value. But what you're doing is if you say, well, if this is the value only we can deliver, like wh why did, why, like how, why do we get to that? Like, what is it that we know about the market that no one else really understands? And so instead of starting with, you know, some generic trend or starting with here's the, you know, the problem, which my competitors could all define the same way. Instead, at IBM, we always started with like, here's what we know that, you know, other people that maybe serve different kinds of customers, whatever, don't know this. So I, I like that starting. So in a good sales pitch, basically tees that up and says, look, like, like we see this and it's kind of like another way of thinking about it is like the problem inside the problem or the root cause of the problem. Like you're here because you want to do better accounting. But what we've seen is this, right? So, so we start with that and then we paint a picture of the whole market and, and, and split it up according to that. Like, okay, it, it, this is what we see. Now let's look at what your choices are. You can pick these guys and they're good for this, but not good for that. Or you can pick people that, you know, do it this way and they're good for this or good for that. Or you people that do it this way, good for this, good for that. But really, and while we're having that discussion, we're pointing out there's a big gap there. And then we're saying, look, like we think for customers like you that really want to get this thing done, you know, perfect solution probably looks like this, right? And then we got to, we get kind of aligned on that. And then we say, okay, now let me show you my stuff. And my pitch is all, all the way oriented around, look, this is the value we can deliver that no one else can. And my demo is, let me show you how we do that. So if you want, I can give you an example. Yeah, please. I yeah. think you're right. Please, so it's one thing to talk about it theoretically. It's another thing to talk about examples. So here's my example. Um, so this is a company that I did some work with called Help Scout. Maybe you know them. They're in uh, um, customer service software. And they're interesting because, you know, they, they started out working a lot with direct-to-consumer brands. And one of the things that they observed, their insight into the market is that direct to consumer brands think about customer service in a different way, um, and and it's because you know they don't have stores and they they generally don't talk to people at all, like on the phone or anywhere at all, and so they actually see customer service as a growth driver. Like if we can serve people really well, then they'll be more loyal to us. They'll come back. And there's a bunch of good research that shows that this is true. Now, if you look at uh, Help Scout's competitors. They kind of have two competitors. Like if you're really small direct to consumer brand, um, usually you start out doing doing uh, customer service with just a shared inbox because like, it's easy to use and everyone knows how to use it, and it works fine until things get a little more complicated. You start to grow, and then you wish you could do prioritization or assignments and things that you do with help desk software. And so if you can't do that with the shared inbox, then you got to go to like full blown help desk software, which is like Zendesk. And then you go, and the problem with that is really hard to use, but it does all the things. Like it has all the features that you want, prioritization and automation and all the stuff that you want. The only thing is that it, it, those companies came out of help desk software 
where they think of customer service as a pain in the ass, basically. And, and what they're trying to do is drive the cost down. So if you come to customer service, they're trying to get the customer to go to a low touch channel. You know, they assign the customer a number. You know, you're not a person. You got a case number. You know, they're trying to get you to just use the FAQ or, you know, or, you know, speak to this chat bot, which isn't a person at all. This is just some AI thing. So they're all about taking the cost out of it. Now, so I'm Help Scout. Um, the neat thing about Help Scout, if you look at the way they've designed the software, they've designed it the way you would design it if you were one of these consumer direct to consumer brands in that they make it really easy to use just like a shared inbox. It looks just like a shared inbox, easy to use like a shared inbox, but it does all these advanced help desk things like prioritization and automation and all this other stuff, but it doesn't do it at the expense of the customer experience because they, they look at this different. They, they, so the customer gets to pick what channel they want to deal with you in and they don't get assigned a number or their person, you know, all this stuff. Okay. So that's the, that's the positioning, right? So their differentiated value is a handful of things. Like one, you know, it really super easy to use, easy to get your people on board stuff. Looks just like an inbox. It's great. But two, you're not going to outgrow it. Does all this fancy advanced stuff that you want. And then three, does it in a way that gives a customer a great customer experience because you know that's really important because you think about that as a lever for growth. That's my differentiated value. Okay. So. Think about how we pitch this in a sales pitch. So I got this differentiated value all over my website. Customer comes, clicks that button, says, give me a demo, right? <laughs> he goes over to sales to get a demo. Does, does sales go in there and say, okay, let me show you all the features. Here's a feature, here's a feature, here's all the drop-down menus, here's all the features, blah, 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 blah. What's the customer going to think? They'll be like, I don't know, looks like an inbox. We're already using an inbox. That, you know, I don't know. And they'd be like, I don't know, got some stuff, looks like Zendesk. Does it do everything Zendesk does? It's really different than Zendesk. I don't know. Right. Mm. So if I go in and just give them the feature walkthrough, maybe people get it, maybe they don't. Instead, here's what the sales rep, the, what the Help Scout sales rep does. Customer comes in, Help Scout sales rep starts with the, starts with the market insight. Say, hey, hey, direct to consumer brand. We work with a lot of direct to consumer brands. Here's what we see. What we notice is companies like you treat customer success or customer service differently because they actually see customer service as a growth driver rather than a cost center. Customer goes, yeah, yeah, you're right. You know, and they got some data to back this up. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, we do. We do see it like that because we understand great customer service, great for our business, right? Right. It is. Yeah. Now, look, we realize you got choices and we work with companies like you all the time. So- most of the folks we work with, they start with a shared inbox. You start with a shared inbox. Oh, yeah, yeah, we're using a shared inbox now. Oh, yeah, see, that works. Really easy to use. Everybody likes it. Until you start growing, then you run out of these features that you want, right? Yeah, that's a pain in the ass. Well, then then you get, then you're looking at help desk software. Great thing about help desk software, it has all the stuff, right? It has all the advanced features you need. Two problems. One, kind of hard to use. And two, sort of treats everybody like a number. Like it, it, it doesn't care about customer experience. It's actually optimizing for something you don't want to optimize for. So in a perfect world, what we'd have is customer support software that, you know, one, easy to use as an inbox, two, has all the advanced features you need so you don't grow out of it, but three, treats customer experience like it's a first-class citizen, like this is really what we're trying to do, right? Now this is a moment in your sales mm. pitch. Uh, so far, I haven't pitched. I haven't actually pitched Help Scout yet. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just drawing you a picture of the market, <laughs> and I'm saying, look, like for guys like you, these are the things you should be worried about, right? Now, if you look at me and you say, "Well, yeah, that is what I want," now I got you. Like all I got to do is show that we do that. So then I go. So, so I say, you know, you want these three things, right? The customer goes, yeah, right. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, great. Here's us. We're Help Scout. We're all about, you know, advanced customer service functionality. It's really easy to use. Treat your customers great. Here's our value. Our value point number one, super easy to use, right? Oh, let me show you. Look, there's an inbox. Just, just like an inbox. Here's how you do some stuff with that. Super easy to use. Number two, advanced features so you don't have to grow out of it. Oh, here's how we do prioritization. 
here's how we do automation. Here's how we do this stuff. Last one delivers a great customer experience. Let's show how we do that. Customer gets to pick their own channel, doesn't assign them a ticket number, blah, blah, blah. So I'm still giving you a demo. It's the demo is totally oriented around my differentiated value. And I give you this setup at the beginning to help you think about the whole market. Here's why you don't want to use Zendesk. Here's why you don't want to keep using a shared inbox. So it's a completely different way of thinking about how to do this pitch. It's thinking about it from the customer's perspective. What does the customer need in order to make a decision, right? I'm trying to answer the question, why pick me over the alternatives? Not why pick me? <laughs> so that's how it works in my mind. I love that that four things there is so clear, you know, the inside, the market inside, the alternatives here, and then the gap in the market, and then finally the value yeah. that enables. This sounds like a, a sequel to your first book, obviously awesome. Is there is that something that you're seeing in the future? Like Maybe. obviously awesome yeah. part two. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. So part. I'm you know, if you see me at a conference, I'm talking about this stuff right now. And so I've been teaching this to my clients for years. So, you know, if, if you work with me and we do positioning work, the, the two things we get out of the workshop is we do the positioning and then we take that positioning and translate it into a sales pitch. And so the immediate thing you can do with that new positioning is get your salespeople pitching that way. Um, so I've been doing that for a long time. I want to shift gears and, and talk about career, um, specifically marketers. You've been in marketing and consulting space for over 25 years. Yeah. What's something that's helped you in your career that's like advanced that you, if you can go back in time, you'd give that that power up or that advice or that special thing that's helped you in your career to your younger self? Yeah. Like, you know, in the beginning of my career, I really thought, you know, and this, this may be specific to me because, you know, at the beginning, like I didn't study marketing. A lot of people in marketing didn't study marketing. Like I come out of systems design engineering, but I went in through product marketing and, you know, I thought at the beginning, like I was really worried about tactics, right? Like how could I get really good at tactics? Like how to be really good at SEO or really good at email, or really good at events. Um, but then the more senior I got, the more I realized like tactics are tactics and the tactics change all the time and the channels change all the time. But there are these bigger questions that are kind of at the heart of what a good marketer needs to figure out. And so I think my career really started to accelerate at the point when, you know, I stopped worrying so much about marketing and, and spent more time thinking about markets, right? Wow. Like market strategy, go to market strategy. What are we trying to do in the market? What are we trying to be in the market? And then let's figure out the tactics that map to that. And so for me, that was kind of a a game changer. The other thing I would say, you know, I did this, so this isn't advice to me. Uh, this is more like, congratulations, April, you did a good thing, was um, I moved around a lot. And and at the beginning, it wasn't on purpose because I, I kept working for these little companies and then they would get acquired. And then you'd be at the big company for as long as you could take it. And then you'd come out, go to another little company and bounce back and forth. But in the moving around a lot, it, it gave me a lot of perspective on what works and what doesn't. And what I see a lot with junior marketers is they've done one job at one company or two jobs at two companies and they think they know everything. <laughs> <laughs> and what you learn right. by like company number four is you don't know nothing <laughs> because every company is different. And so, but where, but what you do start seeing is there's this common underpinning on the stuff that you do. And so this is part of the reason why I got so interested in positioning because, you know, the tactics would change, the way we go to market would change, the, you know, the routes we were using and stuff would change, but there'd be this underlying strategic bunch of stuff that was really important. And if you could figure that out, you know, then everything else we did downstream from that is better. So I think bouncing around a lot, doing a lot of different things early in your career is actually good. This was such a great framework to help create product stores and sales pitches that sell. You can find out more about April Dunford and her work by going to her website, aprildunford.com and following her on LinkedIn. Those links are in the show notes and description. If you enjoyed this episode, you'd love the Marketing Power Ups newsletter that I send out each week 
share the actionable takeaways and break down the frameworks of world-class marketers from each episode. You can go to marketingpowerups.com to subscribe and you'll instantly unlock the five best marketing frameworks the top marketers use to hit their KPIs consistently and wow their colleagues. If you want to say thank you, please like and follow Marketing Power Ups on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. If you're feeling extra generous, kindly leave a review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify and leave a comment on YouTube. It goes a long way for others finding out about Marketing Power Ups. Thank you to Mary Solden for creating the artwork and design. Thanks to 42 Agency for sponsoring this episode. And of course, thank you for listening and tuning in. Well, that's all for now. This is your host, Ramley John. Till the next episode, have a powered update. Bye. Marketing Power Ups. Until the next episode.